So it's funny that you uh, you kind of asked the question of why talk about money, and um, <laughs> the question being why not is not just a, that's not just a flippant comment. If you don't get this, you will not get the rest of the kingdom. Period. Jesus said it. Don't get mad at me. He said it. We'll get to that. Uh, people get a little uncomfortable sometimes if if you like really start bringing you know talking about money. And the question I have is, why do you get uncomfortable? It's because it's getting close to your heart. Matthew six twenty one: For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You want to go after the heart of the Father? Give Him your treasure. Let your heart and your treasure be in Him, and then you'll have the rest of Him. See, we we tend to we tend to think separately when it comes to money and finances, and the big part is we talked about it in the first session because you're carnal if you think that way. <laughs> Because it's a, it's natural. It's like, well, what does God have to do with this $20 bill? This is just natural. And we, we tend to think, well, that's, that's something separate. When you allow God to get into your wallet, get to get into where you, you, you live from, then he begins to get into the very core of what you trust. And we'll, We'll talk about that, but I, I, um, I've done this before in church, which is really fun to do. If you have a whole room full of people, I had everybody get out their wallet or their purse and hand it to the person behind them. I dare you just take your wallet and give it to someone else. Trade wallets. See how it feels. Get, or, does anybody have a new vehicle? Give the keys to your brand new BMW to someone else. There you go. Test it out. It just, just like if you think of the things you you possess as yours, give them away and see what happens to your heart. It feels like you can actually feel it pull on the strings of your heart, especially if you worked hard for it because you actually deserve it now. You've actually earned it. And you go, well, it's mine because I worked for it. Do you understand that even if you worked for it, even if no matter how you've how you've acquired things, if if they have attached to your heart, that is where your treasure is. So the first step is to be honest with where your treasure is. What you treasure. This uh it comes back to a word that I think we misunderstand, and that is stewardship. So we could we could put a title up here and talk about, okay, this is stewardship. You'd be like, oh, great. We're going to talk about money management, you know, financial stewardship. And the reality is we have been trained incorrectly in what stewardship actually means. It's not about hoarding money or being frugal. We, we, I think I can be pretty safe in saying everybody, maybe, but Josh has grew up, grew up in a, uh, Amish Mennonite Anabaptist background, but even in other backgrounds, there is, uh, a high priority given on, you know, penny pinching. You can, you can talk about the whole Jewish culture. What's it, what's it known for? you know, miserly, being very careful. That That's not about, that's not stewardship. Being frugal and hoarding money is only about you. It's not about the one who owns the money. Now, God is very good with his money. He, he, he accomplishes a lot with it. So he is, uh, he knows how to leverage it. But when you just think of stewardship as penny pinching, you're going to miss the heart of the Father. 
because he is also a king and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills he owns all the gold in in on the earth is his he he even said it so if you were the richest king in the universe and you wanted to accomplish something and you had the money to do it you just go and do it right when i think of how we treat finances and the especially you know you've worked for it, you've got a paycheck you you have to divvy it up and make sure the bills get paid we we really we get used to managing it ourselves being careful with it and and make sure things get done there's nothing wrong with that i'm not disparaging frugality or money management it's good to manage your money and not waste it okay but just doing that is not the epitome of financial stewardship christian financial stewardship it's about knowing the father's heart i learned this in a when i when i moved to washington uh it was my job was property manager on a golf course that had gone bankrupt and we rebuilt the golf course and built lodges and things and so the the family and company that had bought this property um, had extra wealth that they were working with that's the point of this property was a, (laughs) a tax shelter it was like let's let's make use of this money but there was never a question in my mind whether there was enough money. There's always enough money. It was, are we using it? Not just wisely by what I would say is wise, but what does the king, we didn't call him a king, but what does the boss want to do with it? So when it came time to doing the construction, we're you know working with a contractor and have a whole budget and things and and the contractor one day, uh, he, there was a bill that I had to, I processed all the bills and had to approve everything. So nothing got paid unless I authorized it. And so this was early on and I, I don't remember what the thing was, but it was like three times what had been budgeted, but it wasn't a huge amount. It was like a $30 item and it was charged as $90. I think that it was like really close to that amount and I approved it and the contractor came to me and he said, you got to do your job or not. And I'm like, excuse me. And he was a, he was a fatherly figure. He really taught me because he cared about me. Is it, I mean, he, it, this wasn't, he wasn't being mean to me. He was teaching me, but he said, I went through the bill and I saw that I overcharged you. He didn't actually do the bill. His, his wife did the bills. And he said, we overcharged you. We charged you $90 for something that's $30 and you approved it. What are you even there for? I could put anything through you just to prove it. And I said, well, I trust you. Um, it's not like we don't have the money to pay it. And <laughs> He got mad. He's like, really? So if you go to Burger King and you buy an $8 burger and they charge you $24, are you okay with that? Like, no. He said, just because it's someone else's money, you're willing to spend their money? You're willing to to pay three times the amount for something just because you have it? He said, if you don't do your job then there's no point you being here. And I, here I was, I mean, he's asking me to hold him accountable. And I realized, you know what? If I have this mentality that, well, God's got everything, so what difference does it make? I'll just, that can be just as, as detrimental and anti-kingdom <laughs> as grabbing on everything and not being willing to spend it. Now, one of the goals of the boss was to support the local craftsmen in in the valley where we lived in the mountains. And so he said, is there a local 
blacksmith that can that can make all of our uh, our wall sconces, lights, cabinet poles, everything. We had everything handmade by a blacksmith, uh, by a, a local craftsman. Do you realize what a cabinet pool costs when you got a guy there heating it up in a forge and pounding out an acorn? <laughs> it's expensive. I mean, just the just the lights. Every single one of them was handmade and and had special mica in there that was the diffuser for the light. That's like, okay, I could go to Lowe's and get a $50 wall sconce that looks really nice. Or I could pay $500, which is what we paid, and something like that. Pay 500 bucks per light. Is that a waste? Boy, it sure seemed like it to me. I'm like, these lights are no better than the light we could get at Lowe's. And he said, yeah, but Lowe's doesn't support this local valley. So I want to spend it. So the king, the boss, spent, I don't know how much. I have to add up all the lights. Thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands, extra on lights and drawer handles and things like that. Why? Because it went to the guy right up the road. And that's on his heart. I learned a lot as a 24-year-old kid <laughs> on what stewardship means. What What is stewardship? I didn't just make the decisions as I saw them. I became the boss because I got his heart. He didn't live there. They lived in Seattle. My job was to be the owner's representative. Every decision that was made within that first year, especially that first year was the biggest learning curve for me. But even the rest of the time while being there, I learned to think like the king, the boss, the owner, the one who actually owned all the stuff. I, I did it as he would want it done. And someone could criticize me. They could go, why are you spending all that money? And I, I'm, I was free to go, that's what we want to do. It's the decision that we've made. I don't even have to explain it to them. I don't even have to make it seem good to them because they don't have anything to do with it. The boss and I had a conversation and the boss said, this is what I'm going to do. So, stewardship is getting the heart of the king. Get the heart of the king. Learn the heart of the king. Now, the first session, it came back to relationship with God. <laughs> this is the same. It comes back to relationship with him. If you don't have an active, growing relationship with God that 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 has flow to it, then you really aren't you really aren't in step with him. And it's going to be hard to consistently be in line with his desires for you. So when I was thinking of what stories I tell, um, I'm like, man, I've made a lot of decisions. Probably most of the decisions I've made have had money attached to them somewhere. You know, you can't quit your job if it, not have money attached to it. You can't buy, you know, get something new without buying it, paying for it. So money is like this common denominator in our lives. And you, you, you buy milk with it. You, you reward someone else for it. You, you use it as a tool. And so it, it becomes just this interwoven thing in our lives. Let's look at what Jesus said. Luke 16 verses 10 through 14. He said, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is, is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things and they derided him. Okay, remember I started out saying, if you don't get this, you won't have anything else in the kingdom. You won't learn anything else in the kingdom. Jesus said, if you have not, therefore, if you are not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What are the true riches? The true riches are the the rest of the principles of the kingdom of God. Everything else in the kingdom is based on your understanding of money. If you, unrighteous, he calls it unrighteous mammon. There's nothing righteous about money, but if you're, if you're faithful with it, it will convert into a spiritual tool, something that actually affects you in your heart. You cannot serve God and mammon. I, um, I'm thinking about people that I've interacted with over the years when it comes to, you know, their own personal finances or their judgment of, of other people. So again, living in Washington, I represented a rich boss. So I had to deal with this. What do people think of me? And there was a time where I didn't want anything to do with it. Like I didn't want people to think, well, he's either, I didn't want them to think that I'm rich and I didn't want them to think that I had control over a lot of money. I just want them to let me alone. Like, just, just don't worry about me because immediately there's this feeling of judgment. But so much of it was internal in my own heart. So much of it was just a fear about it, not even reality. And I had to come to grips with living according to what was in front of me, what the Lord had provided and what he had me to manage. And if you want something that will test your, your own pride, uh, try being rich. I've been poor and I've been rich and rich is better for sure. Rich is better. Absolutely. Now, there's a lot of learning that can happen in when you're poor, when you when you don't have anything else uh, to attach your trust and your faith to. But God has a lot he wants to accomplish. And the devil has tried to keep people poor, thinking that they're spiritual by being poor. Do you know why? Because then they are now powerless in the natural to accomplish things with one of the major tools in our culture, in any culture. So God wants, wants to give us the tools. If the tools attach to our heart, he can't give it to us. If the tools do not attach to our heart, he's unlimited. He can give us whatever he wants. So he constantly is giving us an amount to see if it attaches to your heart to see if it attaches to your heart. And the way he tests this is he says, here you go, now give it away. And you go, I got it. Oh, it attached. Okay, I can't give him that right now. I'll give him another, I'll give him another test here. I'll see if I can, see if I can help him to, to use it the way I want to use it, not let it attach to your heart. Especially, this is where it's difficult, when you've worked for it, you've earned it. Then you go, well, it's mine. It's not yours. It's mine. I did the work. I sweated for it. You sweated with the ability that God gave you to work. You sweated with the breath he gave you. You sweated with the strength he put in your arms. Still his. He gave you everything you have. Jesus, talking about uh, if you'll not be faithful with that with his rich, he talks about or, uh, unrighteous mammon who will give you the true riches. He's talking about what's attaching to your heart. And I, I'm thinking of, you know, the statement that the love of money is the root of all the evil that, you know, okay, where if it's attached to your heart, that's what I would call a love of money. So you, you 
grasp onto it, it becomes your answer. That's why you're grabbing onto it because, well, I, I can use this when I need it. And, and your trust and your faith goes to that. I've seen a lot more poor people with a love of money than rich people. Not to say that there are not rich people with a love of money because they, there definitely are. The only reason is they're still poor in their heart because they still don't have enough. John D. Rockefeller, when asked the question, how much is enough? His answer was a little bit more. <laughs> it's like, man, okay. And, and when I think of rich people that do not have a love of money, they're free to use it. And it's when, when that happens, then the Lord is able to take, to go in and actually move the needle in, in culture, make, make changes, make shifts. And when, when a poor person, someone who just doesn't have money is crying out saying, I don't have enough. I need more money. My answer is money. And their heart turns to a grasping of money. That's the love of money. The love of money is when it becomes your answer instead of him becoming your answer and through him, oh, there was money. Okay. But it wasn't just to get the money. Is that making sense? Noticing where your heart is turning for your answer. Either way, your heart is the determining factor here. Your heart, the position of your heart. 